We're going to get started. All right. Beth is going to uh, get us started here today. Welcome, everyone. If you could keep introducing yourselves in the chat, that would be great. We love to see where everyone is from. Um, I'm going to hand the baton to Beth right now. Great. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 CSLP Summer Symposium. This is our second annual symposium, and we are really thrilled to be back again this year with some excellent sessions. My name is Beth Yates. I work at the Indiana State Library as their Youth Services Consultant, uh, and I happen to be the 2022 president of CSLP, uh, but my term ends on December 31st, and at that point, Kathy Lancaster, the state representative from Michigan, will become your new president. Kathy is the Youth Services Consultant for the State Library of Michigan, and she led the Summer Symposium Planning Committee this year. Yay. Thank you, Kathy. And she will be presenting later today at the decorating session, so you'll hear uh, a lot more from Kathy later today. Before we do get started, I'd like to pause for just a moment uh, to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we may be meeting on a virtual platform, I want to recognize the significance of the lands that we each call home. Uh, we offer this acknowledgement to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. All right. So Today during this welcome section, I will be sharing some housekeeping information. I'll be giving you a quick overview of CSLP, what we are, what we do, how it works, how you can get involved. And finally, I'll be introducing our keynote speaker. All right, let's move on to housekeeping. Um, so first of all, we do have live captioning available today. It's being provided by AI Media. And we will share a link in the chat for those who would like to ask, access the closed captioning. Um, if you have that ready, I also have it if you need. There it is. And then if somebody else wants to continue to add it a few times later, that's probably a great idea. Um, the other thing we'd like to ask of you all today is that when you have a question today for a presenter, use that Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. So if you hover your mouse over the bottom, a menu will pop up and you will see chat, but you'll also see Q&A. Um, and we're asking that if you have a specific question for a presenter you would like answered to use the Q&A, that helps us kind of weed out um, actual questions from just the regular chat. Of course, continue to use the chat if you want to talk to your colleagues throughout these sessions, um, but for specific questions for presenters, use that Q&A. Sessions are being recorded today, so rest assured uh, you will be able to refer to these later, or if you have to miss a, a, ses a session, uh, you'll be able to view it later. And all of the resources that we talk about today, all the recordings, and a downloadable continuing education certificate will all be available on the Summer Symposium website. Um, in addition to those other recordings, uh, back on November 22nd, CSLP's Inclusion Committee hosted a webinar from Kaleidoscope Youth Center in Ohio. It was titled Cultivating Affirmation and Belonging for the LGBTQIA plus Youth. And that recording will be, host, uh, will be posted along with today's recordings and they'll all be on that summer symposium page. Um, this was a really wonderful session. So we encourage you to check it out. Here's the schedule for today. Um, you can come and go as you need today. We recognize that reference desks need to be covered and that programs need to happen and that not everyone can attend all sessions today. So if you do leave and want to come back later, you'll use that same link for all sessions all day um, that you used to enter in the first place this morning. 
Uh, we will take breaks between each session and the full schedule for the day can be found on the CSLP website, um, which has been shared in the chat and will probably be shared again, hopefully. But just a heads up, our first break is 30 minutes, the second break is only 15, and the third break is 30. We'll remind you of this as we go, though. All right, so what is the Collaborative Summer Library Program? Well, our official mission is that we empower libraries to foster community. And we do that by collaborating with libraries to create an inclusive literacy-based reading program that's enjoyable for all ages by providing reproducible programs with a unified theme and by sharing resources and offering professional support. But in short, CSLP is really a, just a group of people from public and state libraries across the nation who are trying to make summer programming easier for practitioners and more meaningful to communities. CSLP is a nonprofit. All of the funds raised from our membership fees and catalog sales go right back into supporting future summer programs, including into items that we offer in our online store. And speaking of the online store, I'll take a quick moment to mention that our online store is open and can be found at shop.cslpreads.org. Somebody is able to drop that link in the chat. Um, this is where you can purchase posters, reading logs, incentive items, and more. All right, a little bit more about CSLP itself. Um, CSLP has only two and a half paid staff. So what we mean by that is two full-time staff and one part-time staff, and the rest are volunteers from state and public libraries. Plus, we are able to fulfill a lot of our work because we contract with many vendors like our artists, uh, our artist this year, Frank Morrison, and lots of other vendors who support various areas of the program. And just a side note, we are currently without one of those full-time staff. Um, our executive director position is currently vacant. vacant. Um, so we, we ask your patience if you email the CSLP offices for assistance in the next few months. Our wonderful CSLP administrator, Melissa Hook, who's here today, is wearing multiple hats right now. And so it might just take a little bit longer than normal to receive your response. Um, but we, we, your, your questions are important to us. So we will absolutely get, get to it. So just to drive point, uh, just to drive the point home, excuse me, that we are volunteer supported. You can see here what a huge impact our volunteers really make, uh, from state representatives to board members to committee chairs and committee members. It really takes a lot of people to run CSLP. So you can see why the word collaborative is in our name. Uh, FYI, the majority of states are full state members, and that means that the state libraries in those states are probably paying for membership for all of their public libraries. Um, but if you happen to be in a state that's not a statewide member, individual libraries can still join for just $20 a year. Quite inexpensive, really. Um, if you aren't sure whether your state is a full member, you can check the CSLP website where we list all member states. And I think they're going to, there it is. They dropped it in the chat right there if you want to go check. Um, you can also see who your state representative is. Most of the time they work at your state library, not always, but usually. So by now you might be asking, how do I get involved? Um, well, there are a few different ways that you can get involved with CSLP. The most obvious active way to get involved is to join a committee. We generally do an open call for committee volunteers in August or September each year, and each state representative usually shares this information out to their states in some way, you know, via state listservs or however your state library communicates with your libraries. Um, this information is also, though, always on the CSLP website. So come August or September, you can check the website and see if it is posted yet. And you can see we have many different committees, so there's usually something for everyone. If you have a particular interest or strength, consider sharing your expertise with the organization. 
You can also submit program ideas or resources for future programs. Um, we do work ahead here at CSLP. So while public libraries are just gearing up for summer 2023, CSLP is already at work on the 2024 manual where the theme is going to be adventure. So if you have an adventure related program or idea, you can go to the website and submit a programming idea. Maybe it will be included in the manual. You can also join our Facebook group. We have a CSLP page on Facebook that shares news and announcements, but we also have a programming group that you can join. It's pretty active and folks share lots of different programming and decorating ideas there. So if you're on Facebook anyway, we encourage you to check it out. So to wrap up this section of my presentation, I really can't stress enough how much we depend on public library staff to make this program great. Thank you to everyone who's participated on committees in the past, and thanks in advance to those of you who will join us in the future. All right, and now I am so excited and pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Tracy D. Hall became the 10th Executive Director of the American Library Association, and notably the first Black woman to helm the organization in February 2020. Ms. Hall has served in numerous library and arts leadership positions nationwide, including Culture Program Director at the Joyce Foundation, Deputy Commissioner of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, Vice President of Strategy and Organizational Development at Queens Library, Assistant Dean of Dominican Univer University's Graduate School of Library and Information Science, Community Librarian at the Hartford Public Library, Youth Services Coordinator at the Seattle Public Library, and much, much more. Ms. Hall holds dual bachelor's degrees from University of California, Santa Barbara, and master's degrees from the Yale University School of International and Area Studies, as well as University of, Washington, University of Washington School of Information, excuse me. She is a native of South Central Los Angeles and currently lives in Chicago. And in 2022, she became only the second librarian ever to be honored with the National Book Awards Literarian Award for a Lifetime Achievement. Suffice it to say, Ms. Hall's contributions to the library world are plentiful, and we are incredibly honored that she's taking time to speak with us today. So please join me in welcoming ALA Executive Director, Tracy D. Hall. Hello, everyone. I am fighting the urge to say, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I am so hyped. I am so excited. I, you have to bear with me because I went from being like, oh yes, you know, I'm happy about doing this presentation because summer reading is so important to me to like this morning, just having to calm myself down. I am so excited and I have to tell you why. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody who's been involved uh, in uh, the creation of this program and everyone who is doing the work out there in community. I can tell you right now that uh, this and these types of offerings are what make libraries indispensable in our community. And all, this presentation is all about 100 different angles, reasons, arguments uh, to really uh, make sure that everyone knows that this is one of the most important contributions that we can make to our communities, wherever they are and however we define our communities. But before we get into what is really kind of have sort of uh, talking with you and have presentation. I always say that the deck that I provide is just to make sure I don't lose some ideas. Not all the ideas are contained in this PowerPoint. I'm also looking at chat and I love to engage uh, in chat. One of the gifts of virtual meetings for me has meant that the two sides of the brain, the oral, but also the thinking brain has an opportunity to communicate. So definitely use chat if you wanna 
come back, if you want to share something, let's use that. It's a tool and it's a resource. And I understand that some people, the way that you are sort of organized, you only want to participate in just the actual what's happening uh, right now in real time, what you can see, what you can hear. Others, to reinforce that, it's okay for you to use chat. So take care of yourselves uh, this morning and Make sure, though, that you are communicating some type of way. And we will have 15 minutes at the end uh, to talk together. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. But before jumping in too quickly, I want to just stay right here where we are, right here on this slide, the, the ideas. The first idea that I want to kind of open up and interrogate and look into is this notion of together. What do we mean when we say all, we all understand that, and now, like this moment, this summer, this next year, but what do we mean when we say together? And that's one thing that I, I wanted to really look up. I always uh, think to myself that uh, part of, uh, I think full understanding is really making sure that we understand the basis or the root of some of the words that we use. So I wanted to think about together. And here are some definitions that I wanted to share with you. Together meaning in proximity to another person or people. Uh, in companionship or close association. And finally, informally, we use together to describe a state of being self-confident, um, a level-headed, well-organized. So I want to sort of posit that all of these things give us instructions when we think about summer reading and when we think about the possibility of summer reading programs. So proximity, to people, companionship, uh, efforts that bring people together, whether in person or virtually, that we do these types of programs, the summer reading programs, help to instill self-confidence, self-esteem, and that also allow or support people in feeling it, states of being together, well-organized. So I just want to share that and then uh, really talk now about some of the ideas that we're going to talk about today. Libraries as places of belonging. How do libraries build a civic bridge? Libraries as educational spaces or learning hubs. I think ounce for ounce, pound for pound. Libraries are the largest provider of education across the nation because we focus on lifelong education. So going beyond that sort of zero through uh, 12, beyond that post-secondary education and moving into lifelong education. So as we think about multi-generational education and as we think about ways that we engage uh, uh, elders as well as people who may not necessarily be participating in or who may have left a uh, traditional education, I'm really thinking about libraries as claiming uh, their role as educational spaces, and those of us who work in libraries as claiming our space as educators or educational support staff or educational administrators. I want to talk about the third great wave of library services where I think we are right now. The fight against information poverty, this is something that is stuck in my craw, and if you know me, you know that this is something that I'm always going to infuse um, in, in the conversation. And then finally end with a call to action, which we'll explore more and articulate more in our conversation together, because what I'm hoping is that each of you will share what you're called to do uh, as a result of uh, not only my presentation, but just our convening today. Next slide. So how many of you, and I'm looking at chat, are familiar with Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone? This came out years ago, but it's resurfacing. And I think it's resurfacing, of course, because of the pandemic and the fact that during that period, it had uh, the pandemic exacerbated, of course, geographic isolation, but also the sense of social is isolation. So Bowling Alone is, is really an important um, definitely. It's an interesting book. I think it's definitely worth a read if you haven't read it um, and you can pick it up or just pick up an article about it uh, to get some of the ideas and digest them. I think it's important. But the reason why I'm really stressing this is because 
I believe that it is important for us to think about libraries as places of belonging and being together. And I remember when I first became a library manager, uh, our director of neighborhood services said to me, uh, Tracy, what's really important about libraries, whether they be school or public or community college library, academic library, is that libraries function as both small businesses, as town halls, as civic organizations, and as community centers. And in order to do the job or to fulfill what li the capacity, the true capacity of libraries, you have to spend time in all of those spaces. And I also think, as I said, that libraries fulfill a unique role as an education center. So when we think about bowling alone and this idea that what's collapsing in society and what we kind of see echoed in these conversations about um, politics that have really, really served to sometimes um, uh, uh, alienate people or conversations uh, now about book banning, which we'll get into um, a bit. We know that reading builds empathy. And we also know, as we'll interrogate in a moment, that many people are not reading deeply, that we're not creating enough visible access points for most people just to read as a community. And so unless people are in contact with new ideas, different ideas or challenging ideas, they don't really have a space or a place to develop empathy. And without empathy, we cannot be a society. We cannot maintain a society. So uh, again, I do think that uh, this conversation of places of belonging and being together, the library as a civic bridge, this is why we are alive right now in this moment. And this is why I do believe that I don't think of things as accidents. It's not an accident that you are here. It's not an accident I'm here. It's not an accident that somehow we chose to be library practitioners um, in the year 2022 in a period where we are seeing more uh, more bans against books than even the McCarthy era, in, uh, in, in an era where um, we are talking so much about togetherness and being together, but still really experiencing profound loneliness uh, and alienation. So all together now, come on now, I'm with you, Nathan. This is about civics. This is about togetherness. This is about reading as a community to help develop empathy. We're just going to do this together because, Rose, we got this. We got this. And I, I really want to stress this because the reason why I believe that summer reading and summer reading programs are so important is because we're doing the two things that we do to best simultaneously. We're showing off our collection development skills, which is a way that we as libraries demonstrate empathy and resonance with our communities. Our collection of resources and materials is about observation and care. It's about lifting up ideas for our communities. I mean, I could talk a long time about collection development and our responsibility there, but our display, our sharing, our reading guides, our ability to go beyond as well as inside the library to show readers uh, materials that can connect with and edify their lived experience. That and then the programming that is simultaneous to that, that is resonant, that completes that, that is the power of the summer reading program. I believe that this is one of the most important programs that can be offered in a library because it is a, over a prolonged period of time and it creates a curriculum. It finds us at our very best. So um, I am also going to just say a couple of other things and then we'll move because this idea of bowling alone is very important. Again, places of belonging and being together, this theme of all together now, I really entreat you to create physical spaces, virtual spaces that invite togetherness. Even if the space isn't occupied, for my artists in the house, um, for my conceptual people in the house, this is an opportunity to do displays and to have places virtually that demonstrate this notion of being together. Let's normalize being together again, okay? That's how we make, that's how we, we, we make and fulfill democracy by creating spaces that are together. So I just, again, I, I'm, I'm offering bowling alone as sort of um, an idea that might precipitate uh, why we do all together now. So if, if that makes sense, I just, cause I wanted to spend time with the theme, let's move. We're gonna keep going. 
So reading encourages inquiry and makes it a habit. Now, again, I am not telling you anything that you don't know, but what I am here today to do, I think, is to uplift maybe and and, and maybe invite um, some deeper thinking about this theme. So one of the things that we know, um, again, about reading and the benefit of summer reading programs uh, is that in addition to improving reading for young people, they support the development of phonics, reading fluency, spelling, comprehension, vocabulary, uh, 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 increasing vocabulary. Uh, and they help to increase in people who are not necessarily, they don't see themselves as readers. It increases the desire to read. Now, break, I wanna say this. Back in the day when I was first starting, you know, as a librarian, you know, I was in my 20s and all of this, you know, I had some wild locks, right? And I was like smelling like non champa, you know, up at the Hartford Public Library. And, you know, I was just doing all the things like if, you know, how to just doing all the things that you probably shouldn't do, right? I have mood music in the morning because I have one of those libraries that a lot of um, children came to and young people, but adults in the community we have the lowest circulation in the, you know, and this, this has been written about, so I'm not telling any secrets, um, but it, we have the lowest circulation of the entire, of all of the branches. And what I thought to myself is that, you know, I, you know, I can't, I was a social worker. I was in social services before becoming a librarian. And in social services, you have to think about the family as a continuum. And what I thought is that we're not going to be able to even reach all of the young people in this community if we're not reaching the older people and the elders, if we're not reaching working age adults. We also know about generational poverty is exacerbated by generational literacy. And again, we have to create uh, reading as a habit. So what I wanted to do was to make it cool to read. So um, what I can remember, so many people would come to the library because of word of mouth, which we'll get into. And uh, they would say stuff like they would stand at the door and say things like, I haven't been in the library in years. And I would always joke with them and say, are you bragging? And they were like, no, 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 I just haven't. But what they were speaking to is that we had created a, a, a condition that compelled them to come to the library uh, because we were creating all of these amazing programs and creating a vibe that people resonated with and also lowering the expectation of what people need to come, of the skill sets that people need to come into libraries with. Because libraries for many people are, they are educational spaces. People have been wounded though in K through 12 and post-secondary um, educational spaces. It's for us to kind of make it inclusive and to recognize our own attitudes that might um, pre pre uh, present barriers. Like, you know, we got to check that attitude, the elitism that sometimes exists. Um, not all the time, but I've been in some spaces where even me, I'm afraid of, of going into the library because, you know, the treatment you get like right at the beginning. So I think that we want to create conditions that help reading become a habit. And we want to understand that reading takes many forms, as we know. But people wake up in the morning reading because they grab that phone or that tablet, they go to sleep with it. So we want to make sure that our, uh, our reading program programs are multimodal and that they utilize and create a, a continuum and an opportunity to have call and response across all of our platforms. So if you have something on paper, lead people, not everybody has digital access, so don't make it like it's contingent on the second part, but lead people across your platforms. Lead people from inside your building to outside your building, from print to digital and back again and create those spaces that make it sort of a feedback loop. Next, please. You all, I'm looking at your comments because this is how I keep going. Uh, I want to just talk about something. This right here is going to get to, you know, it's not important for us to only focus um, uh, to, on, on who comes. It's more important for us to focus on who does it. It's not so important that we just stay in the space of, because sometimes we do stay in the space in libraries of, of who our users are. I'm very focused on who, who our users aren't. So I'm about to go down a rabbit hole real quick. So we got to think about who isn't reading in America. Now, there are two reasons for people not reading. There are people who don't read and there are people who can't read. Our summer reading programs have to address both of them. So I, I grabbed this from Pew Research Center. I'm not gonna read it to you. I know that you're looking on the right, but I just can't resist you know, sharing that about a quarter of people say they haven't read a book 
um, in a, a whole book or even a part of a book in, in the last year. And that's typical. In fact, there are statistics that say that there are as many sometimes as at least 10 people, 10% of the American population that they don't read anything formally unless they have to uh, after they graduate, either from high school or college, or you know, they may not graduate at all. So yes, this chart is important, Lisa. Um, and there's so much research um, and there's so many infographics. I only have a finite amount of time, but I wanted to grab this because it does break down racially. It also breaks down by education. But what I want my rural librarians to do, and I want my suburban librarians to do, Yes, I, but who's surprised by the suburbs? Why do we always assume that suburbs uh, also mean wealthy? What we have to understand is that there are decaying suburbs. There are suburbs that have many, many social issues, but not the financial or social service infrastructure to support. I want all my, my rural and suburban librarians, we're gonna have to meet in some type of breakout or chat because we don't pay enough attention to suburban libraries. We don't pay enough attention. We're getting to, to the space, we're paying attention to rural libraries, but I feel like suburban libraries are the middle children of uh, sort of like the spatial and city planning situation. I could say more about that, but I'm gonna keep moving. I, you let me, let's do it, let's do it. You all, first of all, I just wanna apologize. You know, I get really, really excited about this work because if I don't ever see you again, or I don't see you in person, I need you to know that what you're doing right now is extremely important. But I also, and it's my responsibility, because you know where I work, right? Is that we have to have the facts. These are not anecdotes. It's just not nice to have a summer reading program. It's imperative. And I want my suburban librarians, like the rural, my rural librarians, advocate for yourself, advocate for your sit to your city planners, advocate to your mayors, work with your state libraries. Let's not make suburban libraries the sort of forgotten child of the library ecosystem. Now, my urban folks, you know I'm a city dweller and you know where I come from. We need to expand our services and we actually need to place more and more of our resources in places that are economically isolated and where there are not good bus lines um, or train lines. I could say more about that, but let's go. Let's keep going. All right, so this is where I work, right? This is the American Library Association. If you're a member, put your hand up or put something in there because the thing about uh, ALA is that we do two types of work, right? We support library services, but we also provide services to libraries. So today, this is a part of why I am here at ALA and why pivotal times in my career, I've been back at ALA because some of you may know I boomeranged, but look at what our 12 core values are. Now, this is why people are members of ALA. You're members because you want to support your own knowledge and learning and provide that learning to your community, but you're also members because you want to provide the backbone for services, American library services across the nation. So I just want to big up all of the American Library Association members. And if you're not a member, check us out, you know, join for some time, look, people putting up their credentials, do it, I'm telling you. This is a pledge we take. We, we take a pledge to abide by these core values and these values are uh, re-articulated, restated and re-examined ever so often. I'm not gonna read them to you, but I wanna just in terms of what we're talking about today, all together now, we are talking about access, we're talking about furthering our democracy, we're talking about diversity, we're talking about education and lifelong learning, that's inclusive of intellectual freedom because book banners are, are you know, first people ban books and then they ban people. So that's why we can't abide by uh, censorship. We're talking about the public good and then we're talking about service and social responsibility. So remember that everything I'm saying is sort of undergirded by the values and principles of ALA. Let's keep going. All right. I talked about some don't read and some can't read. Now, for the people that don't read, when we get into our time to talk together, I need you to be jotting down uh, some ideas about how you're going to bring um, together or do a call out or create programming that understands that people don't read sometimes because they don't have time. They don't read because they didn't come from a household or don't live in a community where there has been a reading habit or where reading is rewarded, reading is cool, um, or they don't read sometimes because they don't 
they think that you have some type of barrier that you need to overcome in order to use a library, or they don't have the resources um, to actually make real good use of even free uh, services and opportunities. So we can talk more about that. I wanna move to some can't read. And again, uh, my conviction that we must serve both. Let's look at some of the barriers here. Next, please. So, one thing to hold and let's get uncomfortable with it. Let's get uncomfortable with the fact that we have actually normalized and okayed um, low literacy in some communities. All right, we have to talk about it. Here's a map, find yourself. This is a, this map is a heat map, right? When you get to um, the very lightest areas here, that's where we have very low literacy. We might, uh, adult literacy, we might have something like one in five or one in four adults who have low literacy, meaning that they're not able to read or comprehend um, or apply information past a fifth grade level, okay? And most things that are written that you see on the internet, pamphlets, all of that, um, even la medical language is written at a sixth grade level or up. So examine your websites and your language. Let's be inclusive. We can be really, really profound using simpler words. And I have to remind myself that because there's not a word I don't like. I love all the words. So I have to remind myself when I'm communicating that I wanna make sure that people hear me two ways. They hear me in terms of the research um, orientation that I have, you know, I have, but they also hear me because I'm it's real talk. So it's very important for me to speak plainly, and um, and that's okay because you know I, I I like that too. I also want to remind us that literacy is a multi generational issue. Children whose parents have low literacy levels have a 72 percent chance of being at the lowest reading level. And I want to just ask you right now, do you see a connection to poverty? There is no bigger driver of generational poverty than low literacy. So again, we have to understand that when it comes to the people who can't read, we cannot approve or endorse um, sometimes the, 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 their exclusion um, from our civic places and their in inclusion um, in our civic communications or our community communications, in in including libraries. Next, please. Uh, and I, I wanted to connect reading literacy, digital literacy, and socioeconomic mobility in this fundamental way. There is the National Skills Coalition, which ALA works with um, a lot. But one of the things that really broke my heart is that um, right during the um, the um, uh, pandemic, there were a lot of people who looked at of what was gonna happen in terms of economic recovery. And what they saw is that people who tended to be in blue collar jobs, working in retail or service were like on the front lines and they were really impacted. But one of the things that happened is that they said when polled that if they were expected to work in a truly hybrid workplace or to acquire greater digital skill prowess that they didn't think they could even keep the jobs that they had, which tended to be you know, lower paying jobs, et cetera. So I wanna just say this, that I want us to also imagine our summer reading programs as programs that also help us to focus on reading literacy and digital literacy. Uh, and uh, also again, um, who's not online. So just like uh, we said, who's not reading, I wanted to provide this chart that is um, now three years old. So we're gonna be looking for new data coming out of Pew in terms of again, who's not online. And when you break this down economically, um, you see a huge difference. And this is where rural um, and, um, and, and urban really stand out in this particular case. Next, please. So let's be real. I I see sometimes just I would say that at this point in my career I've been probably in physically about 300 libraries of all kinds academic school public state da da da. da. But one of the things that I see is that if I go through a community where there or even a neighborhood um, or I go to a school where there's a lot of disinvestment, I can already predict how the library is going to look. The library tends to mirror that disinvestment. So what I want to challenge you um, is if you see disinvestment in the community, um, 
is push on all of the systems to not mirror that disinvestment, but to counter it and to resist it. And, and I also think because it's a finite period, we have an opportunity to create this feeling of, of, of investment, if not even opulence, uh, and deep creativity in our summer reading program. Next, please. Yes, yes. Look at Susan's comment, everyone, because digital access does not mean uh, just social access. So Susan is right on here. Again, this is a chart that's talking about race, income, and connectivity. I wanted to show you this because, again, um, there's a whole group of people that come in physically to a location, just like a library, a bank, and then there's a whole other group of people that have a digital experience of it, and we need to speak to both. But it is important that we understand the barriers and and we are so far behind. I think, you know, just like uh, the late Congressman uh, John Lewis said, he said that access to the internet would be the 21st um, century civil rights issue. And I, I think that he's right. I mean, he, he said a lot more, but I, I think that it is one of the key access points. But I, I want you to sort of see and read these slides. This is a Deutsche Bank study came out September 9th, 2020. I remember the date because I, I read it uh, and, and I, I had to call Wall Street Journal to get um, Abjad Walia, this is the researcher who wrote this study for Deutsche Bank to get his information because I had to talk about this. Again, this breaks down in rural communities even deeper. It uh, definitely breaks down when it comes to um, uh, non-native English speakers and it also breaks down in terms of just race and, and poverty. So again, these are things that we should be focused on as well in our summer reading programs creating digital equity and skill development because just having a device is it, that doesn't mean anything when it comes to actually navigating it next please so information poverty information poverty has been described by johannes brits who is a, a library and information uh services uh scholar at university of wisconsin milwaukee he says that information poverty is described as a situation in which individuals and communities within a given context do not have now check this out because here's the list skills abilities or material means so wait, do, do your checklist for your summer reading program is the summer reading program supporting people in both print and digital reading with developing skill sets, abilities for navigating information or the material means, the, the, the books, the articles, the uh, devices to obtain efficient to access information? Because a lot of times in libraries, we focus on access, but we must begin to focus to be truly uh, educational community or institution on interpretation and application. So I want, this is a checklist that I kind of use when I think about programs um, and everybody, we, we have some good stuff going on in chat. I'm looking at um, the fact that this notion of libraries for everyone, that is aspirational. If we look at Lisa's comment up there, many people don't see libraries as being for them or they think that they have to kind of pass a test, if you will, whether it is a scholarship or academic test, uh, literally or figuratively. Sometimes like, you know, a certain type of like residential test in terms of documentation. Um, and some people just feel that they're not the kind of person that can participate um, in programs or be in spaces that are sometimes perceived as being exclusive. So information poverty is further defined by a lack of visible access points. Is our reading program visible to non-library users or to people who don't come to us often? Um, and do we have the information infrastructure? Are we marketing, advertising, creative word of mouth opportunities, uh, finding ambassadors who can share these programs at their church, their beauty salon, in the, um, in, um, you know, the uh, club that they belong in, uh, in the social institution, in their places of practice or work, in their laundromats? And what we want to make sure, again, is that we're helping to build for people who might not have financial capital or educational uh, strong networks, that we're helping to build at least a strong information and social network by making sure the library is a learning hub and a place of belonging. Next, please. So we talked about people who don't read. We've talked about people who can't read, and I want to talk quickly about people who are being denied the right to read. 
So this is where we live, right? We we live here because in the height of the McCarthy era, you know, which was about uh, 47 to 53, uh, the American Library Association, which can't do it all, the a ALA can't fight um, for um, uh, every single uh, person who might be feeling angst, but what we can fight is censorship itself, where we need people to support every single person who might be feeling angst, a young person, their parent, um, somebody in a school. We need our communities, we need DIY, and we need mutual aid. So that means that we need our library summer reading programs to also create spaces of belonging for people who have been marginalized and doing that in a visible way. So these are just some of the many, many books um, that we've seen challenge, confis challenge confiscated, where we've seen lawsuits develop. ALA right now is providing technical assistance in 356 cases individual cases in this country. We don't talk much and can't talk much about the actual cases because um, it's a legal issue, but I wanna go to this next slide. One thing that we have um, launched, we're the first to launch a national anti-censorship campaign. There are many others out there is United Against Book Bans. Um, I would ask you to go to United Against Book Bans and register so that if you have programs and activities that you want to do to make sure that we're not sending a signal to somebody that you don't deserve to uh, know about your social history, um, your voices don't have a right to be centered or even seen. If you wanna counter that, um, then I ask you to go to United Against Book Bans, sign up, um, register programs so other people can learn from them and also um, really organize and develop in your community. If it comes to a legal case, let us know so that we can figure out how to triage or get involved directly, but also seek out any type of anti-censorship uh, uh, opportunity or activity that you can. Uh, this won't abide. We already know that free people read freely. So we're going to make sure that we don't allow the erosion of this Bill of Rights because it creates a slippery slope for all of the others. Next, please. All right, we are in the third great wave of library services, you all. If in the first great wave, we were really focused on normalizing literacy, because remember when libraries were being built in the 1800s, especially in the late 18, early to a late 1800s, you had sometimes three, four out of five adults who were not fully literate. We're at a place now that we have two, so it's still a concerning um, piece in some communities. But again, we have at least normalized um, literacy. The second great wave was to normalize the use of technology. The third, I think, and the most important for us right now is to normalize uh, community education, but also to close the digital literacy and data access gap that is so profound. Uh, and I think that it's important for us to do this for youth and young adults in particular, because um, we are seeing, um, again, uh, a situation where younger and younger people are becoming heads of households. Next, please. There are so many types of literacies. I got a chance to participate a few years ago on the building of this guide, um, the 21st Century uh, Skills Guide. The reason why I wanted to um, list this is because I believe our summer reading programs have an opportunity to amplify and support critical thinking and problem solving, creative creativity and innovation, communication and collaboration, visual literacy, sci scientific and numerical literacy, cross-disciplinary thinking, basic literacy, media literacy, information literacy, life and career skills, social and cross-cultural skills, building that social empathy, recreational literacy, because when we even talk about health literacy, environmental literacy, a literacy that people are beginning to explore is that, you know, as our uh, Elfrida Chapman, great, great, great library and information uh, services thinker at the University of Florida who passed um, in the early 2000s, she talked about the small world theory when it comes to information, that our world's expand as our information expands. If you had limited information, you live a limited life in a small world. And I think this is so important because recreational literacy, if I go to the beach, lake, trail, go to parks, things are free, I look around and you know what? It is not diverse and it's not income diverse because we are not making sure that people have the full literacy and knowledge of recreational opportunities that are free. Libraries, we can do that. That's our work. We can definitely do that. But let's make sure that the library is on the map. Next, please. So connecting spaces for youth and young adults, creating those physical spaces digitally, 
and physically is critical. And it's not just um, important to have the spaces, but I emphasize the ING, the verb of it. How do you, the action work. We have to create those spaces for youth and young adults. And if your youth or young adult space is underutilized, ask young people why, because they need to have those spaces to come together to counter uh, this notion of being alone and of isolation. Next. Connecting spaces for older adults and those who are marginalized. I love this notion of um, the Memory Cafe, supporting people with Alzheimer's and dementia. This is just one example. We don't do enough. We just hired our first accessibility officer for ALA. That was a huge, um, that was so important. I came into the door thinking about that and I was so happy to get the board support for prioritizing that. But you know, again, we don't create enough spaces for people who are dealing with either cognitive or physical um, um, uh, ability needs. And I just think that that's something that's important for us to create those spaces. And again, if I could spend another 30 minutes advocating, just being in pure advocate, advocacy mode, it would be that we have to understand that we're not doing enough in this country for people who are disabled. We just aren't. And, and I'm saying that because coming from a social services background, um, we could do better in 2022. Libraries, let's continue to step up. Next, please. All right, some believe, like me, that libraries can play a role that no other public institution, that no other institution in the public realm can. And I invite you to look at this. This slide here, I really wanted to call out microaggressions and micro inequities. I wanted to call out sometimes the attitudinal um, things that you see in libraries that kind of make people feel uncomfortable. Let's check ourselves and just make sure Let's take care of ourselves. Let's also be good to each other because sometimes you go, if a place, if people treat each other wrong or bad, sometimes customers, they're treating each other wrong and bad, like behind the scenes too. Let's take care of each other. Next, please. So let's remember um, that in all of our findings in information studies, people seek out other people for information. So again, we have to hire and get um, people who, come from communities that we want to reach. And we also have to work on the community ambassador system. Find people who can be the door openers. Gatekeepers, let's leave them alone. But let's get those door openers and let's make sure they know about our programs. Next, please. I want to say, what can we learn from retail or banking? We have to think this way because people are buying and we're beginning to see some real inroads in banking um, in terms of people who previously were unbanked um, in digital space and virtual use. So in libraries, I'm just asking us, when we think about our summer reading program, let's imagine that we are thinking about ways to create ATMs or ways to create uh, shopping experiences that are virtual and that can connect folks as well. Next, please. And then while we're asking questions as we close, this is a closer question so we can have a few minutes of uh, conversation here. I want us to think of a reading service, resource, or experience that your library is consistently being asked to provide that you don't. How are you responding? Is this going to be another year where you say, yeah, that's a good idea, but you don't get to it? Or can you begin to prioritize and adapt? so that we can reach more of the audience that maybe you're not currently reaching now, reach into new audiences and reach into neglected audiences. And I also want you to think of a blatantly non-library reading service, resource or experience that your library is being asked to provide. And how do you create a partnership? If you're not, you don't have to provide it, but you can convene, you can partner, you can make more apparent. So these are just some questions I just wanted to leave you with. And I wanna close right here and let's open this up for conversation. Thank you for being with me every step of the way in chat. Now I'd love to hear from you. Hello, Tracy, can you hear me okay? Beautifully. Hi, I'm Sarah White. I'm the Youth Services Consultant at the Washington State Library, also Go Huskies. Um, I, um, I'm going to go through some of the questions we've gotten in the Q&A, um, and we'll just get through as many as we can. So um, the first question, which came kind of earlier in your presentation, was from Christina, um, asking you to share ideas about how to lead people across our platforms. Yes. Well, the call and response, I think, is really important. One thing that I like that we do here at ALA is that whenever we have like a toolkit or some type of print 
uh, or even a white paper, we have um, either Twitter or, you know, whatever your social, you know, we either have like a Twitter or Instagram kind of chat or a live. Um, I think that's really important. We also do town halls. One thing recently that a library did and they asked me if I would participate is that they had a program that was specifically for um, older people people and they and and they had taught them how to use zoom and then the group met as a book club and so one thing that uh, they asked me to do was to talk specifically about um, folk knowledge because my family's from very rural, rural Louisiana and I've written a lot about outside of the library world about folk knowledge and how we learn about early healing practices and that kind of thing and we had a blast but they had done a couple of things they had a reading club they had read a book they had gone to an exhibition at a local museum and then they were extending it on chat. And so what I loved is that they used um, their print resources, they used their meeting um, capacity, they used partnership with um, another local organization and then they had a Zoom component. And that group had kind of met each other through that program and the 15 of them had stayed together um, across all, all of this. And a couple of them um, really didn't ambulate well. So they have been brought to some of the physical things by caregivers, but they were so happy to be able to be at home learning. So that's what I mean when I think across platforms. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is a, a big question, so I don't know. It might take a while to get through it, but Cassandra asks, how can I create these inclusive communities in closed-minded societies without offending anyone? Oh, that's a great question. The, the thing is, is that in any quote unquote feeling like where people have normalized the feeling or appearance of closed mindedness, there are people who really want, who are, who have an inclusive orientation or who want to explore the world. It's about finding them. I really encourage people who live in really rural communities um, uh, to find the outcasts, um, to find the artists to find uh, the person who runs like whatever, like build your group and, and from that group have each one reach one. Because I, because I, we're not, we're, we wear our identities like an onion wears its skin. I, I'm from Watts, but there's nobody who loved Heidi and read it as much as I did and wanted to believe that I was living in the out somewhere. I related to that I, and we didn't have any goats but I wanted them. And I imagine I would ask my granddad about goats and I'm sure he didn't know what I was referencing, but I wanted us to be living a Heidi life in the middle of what? We wear identity like an onion wears a skin. So let's actually create different outlets to speak to different parts of community. One thing I, I, I think is really fun, you all, is and where you can kind of get to that and cut through that is that people collect, that's what we do. I uh, remember, I think it was at Louisville Public, on one of the public libraries, they had an opportunity for people to explore their collections and to talk about their collections. And that's where you saw that alterity. That's where you saw beneath a veneer of sameness and got a chance to see who people really are. Create those apertures and those openings for people to explore layers of identity. And then it means that the community that which might look like it's all one way or nobody speaks up, that's where you start to hear voice. But we have to create conditions where people can express themselves. Yes, Michelle, see, the wisdom is in the group. That's awesome. Thank you. This is kind of getting back to the idea of cross platforms. And um, we have a question about um, from Carissa about someone who adapted all of their adult programs to virtual formats and then some wanted to go back in person, but a lot of refused to attend in, in person even when it was offered and, um, and it's led to a serious lack of community sense in about 60% of their programs. And they're also worried that removing the virtual option entirely will make it so no one participates at all. So as we like move back into a world with in-person and virtual options, how do, how do you reconcile those things? Okay, I'm gonna I'm a take the Band-Aid off real slow. I'm gonna I have to be slow, slow and steady. We are a hybrid society. I myself go into the store, I wanna buy something, and I see it physically, it might not be my size, I go home and I order it. I need both experiences, right? We wanna offer both experiences. We're still in that liminal state where people are trying to figure it out, right? We, the thing that we don't talk about is that we've also, the pandemic has created 
and fosters social anxiety. So people may feel okay, you know, either maybe they're with, you know, they could go out, but they don't want to. We've gotten out of the habit, 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 habit. Just like the summer reading program all together now, you could not have picked a better theme. This is such an incredible theme, I'm telling you. The foresight around it is just amazing. But the thing is, is that we're gonna have to be really gentle with people and understand that after something like a pandemic, which you're still now moving into, you know, an endemic, that people are uncomfortable being together. We, you know, how many people's houses are as clean, um, at, you know, today as they were before the pandemic? It's like, talk about it. I mean, our bodies, our endurance levels, unless you were like, you know, just exercising throughout, I mean, every everything about us has profoundly changed. We have been through something that people, if we can keep this planet together, 100 years from now are going to be writing about. We're living in it right now. Let's give each other grace. We have been through one of the most stressful periods that any group of people can endure. Let people be hybrid, meet people where they are, for sure, for sure. Y'all, I mean, that touched the core of me because you know what? Do you know that we've been through a lot? Are we giving ourselves and each other grace? Are we allowing ourselves to have smaller programs with smaller turnout and understand the victory in people showing up? Are we okay with knowing that even if people don't respond outwardly, if they see something, they it's a signal, right? Signs and signals, like, okay, you know, going back to anthropology, but you all, we our role right now is to keep doing as best we can and keep doing the best we can. It is not to look at um, just um, outputs only. The, 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 the victory is that we endured. The victory is that we have a summer program that is gonna be focused on all together now and in, 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 in doing that in the midst of still enduring this pandemic. This is the victory. Thank you for saying that. I also think it's it's kind of interesting that our summer reading theme is all together now and together means something so different now than it did three years ago, right? We can be together in different ways than we used to uh, be. Think of it that, think of that word together. Um, so Adrian has a question about digital skills. Um, they are wondering what digital skills would be helpful for patrons to gain who are hesitant to trust digital sources. Um, yes. And what yes. specific in digital literacy would be helpful? This is a profound question and thank you for it. Uh, one of the things that we also have to understand too is that some of the people who don't use, um, who are not online and unfortunately so much of our lives now are online, not by our own sort of inclination, but there are so many uh, taxes, et cetera, medical, educational information that you have to have a, an email address and be able to get to information because it's only sent that way. So we definitely want to understand that and, and take advantage of any grant or anything like that that is going to support instruction. The first thing that we want to make sure is that we are creating um, courses that also allow people to protect their privacy. I can't stress enough that uh, some people don't participate because they don't want to leave a trail. Not everybody is living freely. I mean, there people people are living in a lot of different ways. You all, and not everybody can be free. Um, some people feel like they could be tracked or traced and they might have some you know, things going on. So I think the, any course um, around digital instruction has to start with and spend significant time talking about privacy and then also talking about credible information sources um, and warning against proprietary information sources. Because some of the people that we've seen in other research who don't use um, the internet um, uh, at all or who use it very infrequently do so because of concerns around privacy or that they could be taken advantage of or they have had that experience. So I think that's really important to, to get people to engage. I think the other thing is to make sure that we're engaging people around information that they actually want to know. I am really surprised sometimes that we're still, still teaching generic courses. Um, I think that we can teach courses that are specifically around mental health um, resources or information that, you know, if you have a child with autism, 
um, you know, those types of resources. Or if you're dealing with, um, you know, like many of us in our family, we, we, we have my uncle who is uh, a father figure to me who has profound dementia and that we find ourselves having to navigate our work lives and also to, you know, share care for him. And so bring people together um, for things that they want to know. Let the summer reading program um, that maybe focuses on digital access really focus deeply on all of the different opportunities to engage with the book or an idea, a concept, or a need. I'm just against anything that's generic because for me, I, I move from just the access part of information. I'm all about application and change. So if, if ask yourself, Sonia Sanchez, you know, the poet, I, I took a poetry class with her when I was really young. Um, and I remember I read a poem that, you know, I'd written and she said, oh yes, a very good poem, but who does it set free? And so now that's my orientation. If we do a program, who does it help? I love that way of thinking about it. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Um, I'd love from Susan. I'd love to hear more about ways we can get into the community to get teens and then parentheses everyone into the library. You all are you are you like where are you taking these questions from? Because it's like these are the ones that I want to. <laughs> I'm having too good a time because this is exactly what I think about every single day. Okay, first of all, let's just say some things. If you have a little bit of resource or any kind of money, you write a grant, put some marketing uh, funds in there, wrap those buses, get those placards on um, to those trains, um, buy those billboards. Billboards are not as expensive as we think they are. Support your local public radio station um, by you know, buying some advertising there on your, get on your radio station. People listen to the radio still. Um, I think the other thing that we wanna make sure that we do is take advantage of your local access channels. If you have cable, spread the word that way. Uh, and do your find who your partner is in community. It could, you know, see work your civic um, connections and make sure that I, I want to challenge, you know, how the Pareto principle Pareto principle is 20% of the action creates 80% of the result. So what I'm going to ask you is spend 20% of your time advertising and marketing and even programming outside of your library. That's my challenge. Work with your local arts organizations because you know I've always lived that kind of life between those two um, spaces. Work with your local laundromats. Um, here's the other thing: if most of us, and especially if you're in a rural or a suburban community, you're within 50 miles of a correctional facility. Go to the correctional facility. They all have visiting um, spaces. Say, can I create? We have a summer reading program. Can I just create an outlet? Here are um, some of the materials. We can create a kiosk, or here are some magazines, or here is um, a you know a, a, a printout that we created. Just something that is going to get every aspect of your community engaged. Go to your housing projects. Your low. Hold your programs outside the library. I want to say this. When I was at Hartford Public Library, um, we, we went from branch librarian, the nomenclature, to community librarian. And um, Amor Ahmed, who was our um, neighborhood services uh, coordinator at the time or manager, he said to us, branch he leads, he said, for me, you're going to write a monthly report. I need to see that 20% of all of your efforts for this library are happening in community. Because if not, how are you gonna get the circulation? How are we gonna prove value? For, uh, for me as a new librarian, it increased our circulation like uh, as a new manager 198% in our branch. So I just wanna you know, say that my challenge, I hope you all invite me back again because I know you're like, you know what? <laughs> Uh, you all, listen, you have asked the wrong person because this is somebody who loves, who believes that reading is a fundamental human right, who believes that reading change th changes things, and also who believes that the summer reading program is one of the most important programs that a library could offer. So excuse me, but I want to say this. I would love to see that if you... Um, try to implement this uh, Pareto principle, what, it ha what happens with your summer reading program and what happens in your library? How much time do we have um, left, Sarah? Because I want to make sure I make my answer short so we can end on time. Um, we have about seven minutes before we go to break. So we still, okay. we still have time, we're good. Okay. <laughs> um, we have, I'm going to start, 
and we probably won't get to all the questions though. So I'm gonna start um, looking through to see if there's ones I wanna make sure we definitely get to. Um, one I think I wanna ask is from Faith. Um, if you work in a community that is disinvested, how do you get them to engage? It can be very discouraging. Yes, see them first, see them. So one thing to understand about um, sometimes, you know, our communities that are disinvested is that so much is done um, for them or about them, but not with them. Like see them, see who the, there's genius in every community. Who's the artist? Who is, you know, what, who are the young people who come to the library all the time? You know, what does their family look like? Who's a respected grandmother or father figure in the community? Center them, hold tea, you know, um, have tea masters, you know, where it might be Miss Coretta in your program or, you know, uh, in your community, or it might be Miss Nina, you know, or it might be Mr. Cesar, you know, in community. And, and I think create um, places where, local interests and local celebrities um, and local assets are celebrated because a lot of times people look at disinvested communities um, with, um, you know, with uh, these deficit lens. You know, I grew up in Watts. Watts is like the home of some of the greatest artists ever. I mean, public, you know, Wanda Coleman, Mr. Rodia, who made the Watts Towers, Quincy Troop. When people talk to me about Watts, if they have a deficit lens, I'm like, you're not obviously an artist or a reader. Because what you have to know is that some of the greatest uh, uh, examples of cultural production have also come from this community. So I would say, see the community, then move in community, walk somewhere. Uh, you, Oh, I could just say a lot more. I'm gonna have to uh, email me at thall at ala.org and I will record a whole soliloquy and send it back to you because this, there is no such thing as um, a lack of uh, genius. There's, there's, there's a, a lack of light or a mirror. We gotta see what's around us. And we have to begin, if we can, driving is different than walking. I challenge anybody who lives in a disinvested community to find one street that you feel okay walking on or and also in a group and also, you know, just see, see close, see and look and see. So yeah, also understand about the timing of programs. I used to do a lot of evening programs when I was younger, you know, when I've worked in a few uh, communities. And so I always wanted to create a library that I would want to come to. And so we always have all these amazing programs until one day um, somebody said to me, uh, Ms. Hall, you have all these great programs, but some of us elders, we don't feel comfortable going back in our homes after 8 p.m. So can the programs end at a particular time? So we start observing like, you know, when things sunset for a certain groups and then other folks we could, you know, so just understanding the nuances of community and the specific needs of community. And I know you all are doing that, but I, I hear that particular question and it makes me want to wax on. So I'll wait. I'll go to your last question, Sarah. Um, I just want to say that the chat has requested that you start a TikTok series um, called, uh, what was it? It was um, a weekly Tracy TikTok called Tracy Talks in which you send us um, inspirational messages. So you have a new project. Thanks for the chat. Um, you are too kind. I think the last, if probably the last question we'll get to is from an anonymous attendee who asked, what advice do you have for someone from within many marginalized groups who notices barriers and gatekeeping in their system and wants to make change without losing their job? Okay, um, that's a really great question. I, I have three answers that come up to me. One is become an expert in your area, right? Like I, I, I'll, I'll say this to you all. I know about my own experience, and I, I know a few of you on this, so I'm, I'm not alone here. But um, one thing that I have always tried to do, with whatever, because my enthusiasm, you know, if it's something I care about, I'm gonna be like in the clutch, right? But I also try to make sure that I know so much about it that it is not my opinion or anecdote. It is research based even a little anecdote or a little story there is like tons of research that is out there and I want to try to aggregate it so become an expert and whatever you want to advocate for if you want to advocate for you know our branch is not properly equipped and we need to do a better job of serving this particular community get all the information that you can so it's not your opinion it's a fact right so that's number one number two is understand that um, advocacy comes two ways you can advocate in a way that nobody wants to talk to you 
and nobody wants to hear you, or you can advocate in such a way that everybody wants to hear you and everybody wants to support you. Learn the techniques and the strategies associated with the latter, because there are a lot of other things that were happening as to why people like King and Cesar Chavez and um, uh, Wangari, you know, Mathai and all these other people, the reason why they were very effective is because they had also learned compassion, how to modulate um, their speaking so they didn't speak down to people, but spoke to people. They knew how to hype people up and get people really, really um, motivated. They recognized the genius in others and they cultivated it. So learn that type of advocacy. And then the last thing is, um, I'm going to quote Kendrick Lamar, because you know, don't do it for the gram, do it for Compton. Don't advocate just for yourself so you can be seen, um, or I'm the advocate, or I'm the one, I'm the you know troublemaker, I'm the rabble rouser, because believe me, people build whole identities just by doing that. Do it because you love the community and, the, and you want the impact that could happen because of change. You want it so bad that you can taste it. And, and if you can do it like that, believe me, that's when advocacy, it moves from you to, to us. And when it moves to us, that's when you get your power. Thank you so much, Tracy. There's of course many more amazing questions, but we are pretty much at the end of our time. Um, we'll just have to have you back, that's all. <laughs> so thank you so much for spending um, the beginning of our day with us, I think. That was better than coffee. So um, I think I speak for everyone. <laughs> Thank you and everybody. Let's just put in chat at the same time, knowing and, and really harnessing the power of these three words, all together now. I just want to see it all together now flood. I'm Thank you. I'm about to put mine in. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, we now have a 15 minute break and we'll be back. At, um, half after the hour of whatever time zone you have 30 to be in. 30 minute break oh it's today is it 30 thank you sorry i'm um my my brain is still waking up we'll be back um, at um a, at 12 45 for summer library outreach to underserved children and caregivers awesome. that's right it's lunch for some of you yeah, um, 12 45 eastern sorry <laughs> i'm still drinking coffee clearly thank you so much everyone